Hi, buenos días, good afternoon. If you're on the East Coast, como estamos? Uh, I'm Diana, Diana Maya with the Hope Team. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here and to be with you this Saturday morning. Our official morning program is gonna start at 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, but we wanted to provide some space for you all to network with one another. We have some amazing college students and amazing high school stu students and leaders here with us this morning. Um, and we also have some amazing Latina professionals ready and willing to chat with you and get to know you and really excited um, to meet you all. So uh, we wanted to make space in the beginning to um, make sure that you had the opportunity to connect since we can be in person this year. Um, and the Hopin feature has a really cool networking, uh, the Hopin platform has a really cool networking feature to the left, which you'll see go live at about 940. But before then, um, we're gonna have an awesome presentation on networking and specifically virtual networking. Um, so why networking and why is that important to us as an organization? Uh, because building social capital and making connections is important to your future career success. Um, it's how you'll probably obtain your first internship or your first job. Um, networking is about making connections and genuine connections with people. Um, and, but it takes practice. And in a virtual setting, it could be a little different and it could be maybe even just a tiny bit a little more intimidating. Um, so we thought this was a terrific opportunity to um, tell you a little bit about how to get it done. And who better than a recent college graduate who actually got her first job um, virtual networking. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, somebody who's going to present her tips on how to network virtually. And she's actually going to be on her second job uh, oh. thanks to virtual networking. Um, Kiara Gonzalez Duran is a 2020 graduate of UCLA, a former HOPE intern, and a 2019 future history maker. Um, I had the privilege of working closely with Kiara as we designed HOPE's virtual coaching program. Um, it's aimed at connecting first-generation college students with Latina professionals. Um, we are in, I think, our second, we just finished, completed our second cycle of that coaching program, and we've helped uh, over close to 100 young women make connections with Latina professionals and get some support. So with that, um, Kiara is joining us from Tijuana in Baja California. So thank you. We are, I guess, binational here. Um, and I'm just going to turn it away to Kiara. Welcome, Kiara. Hi. Um, well, uh, thank you so much for that. Very warm welcome. I really, really appreciate it. And OK, so a little bit about me. Um, Diana said a little bit about me already, but I did get my first job through virtual networking. I graduated um, last year in September. And it was an interesting thing to do, like to do the job, job hunt, right? Um, so I joined very quickly. I joined this pro online program and I re um, reached out to one of the people who created that program. And I talked with her through LinkedIn. I was like, hey, I would love to learn more about you. She was like, let's set up a call. We called. She told me, "I'm go send me your resume. I'm going to send it to HR. And I got my first job as an assistant at Endeavor Content. So this networking thing, I think it's been really interesting, but I'm going to now give a presentation about networking in the times of COVID. So let me share my screen. Screen. Okay, perfect. Um, so networking is already, as Diana said, like very different in doing it online. So now we're going to give, start talking about how to do that virtually. So introducing yourself. People make first impressions within the first seven seconds of meeting you, right? Maybe earlier you saw me and you made an impression of me. And so how do you take that and make the other person feel welcomed so one of the things that you may want to do since this is like um and you only see the per, uh, the person through the camera you smile and be intentional you know when greeting people you may want to introduce yourself first or you may want to just smile and wait for the other person to to do so but if you want to be the first one to introduce yourself we're going to give you um some tips in doing that so an a virtual elevator pitch so I have a little image right here about what um, what an elevator pitch might be. So this comes from 
being in like a, an office, you're in an elevator and you meet some, like the CEO of a company or a director, you only have like 15 to 30 seconds to speak with this person. So what are you going to, to tell them? So this elevator speech, is, uh, pitch, I'm sorry, is for you to just say everything about you in a nutshell. So how can you do that? You may want to answer these questions, like for yourself, write a little note, who are you? So your name, where you work, what you're doing there. Next, what are your passions? So what are you passionate about? What are you trying to pursue in the future? It may be one, like it may be your professional experience, like what you want to get at. Personally, um, I would like to be a television producer in the future for Latin American content. So I say that. And then what are you currently doing to gain experience? So I'm going to use myself as an example. So because I want to do, I want to be a uh, television producer in the future, I'm currently working as an assistant at a studio to gain experience and learn about how the entertainment industry works. What are you, what are your goals? So again, as I said, um, as I said, you want to be very specific about what your goals are so that when a person that you meet knows about an opportunity that is very similar. So this director, he knows about this job job opportunity. They know, oh, you know, like Yara wants to be a television producer and this production company just opened um, a job, like this position opened. I'm going to reach out to her and ask her if that's something that she might be interested in. And what are your current needs? So many of you guys are either in college or in high school and you maybe want to start looking for an internship or you maybe want to learn a little bit more about a specific field that you're interested in. You can say you can say that in this elevator pitch. At the end, just close like, oh, and I would be very interested in, in learning a little bit more about how the entertainment industry is doing right now with COVID. Is, is that something that you could speak a little bit more about? Or, you know, I'm going to start looking for internships to start preparing um, for my job hunt after I graduate. This is where you say all of these things, correct? So then, next, be genuine. And I think that is a very, maybe like a difficult thing to say, because you're like, well, how am I supposed to be genuine? But be just be genuinely interested in talking to people and learning more about their lives. You know, what is it that they do? What is it that they're interested in? How did they get to their position? Because many, well, many of other people in this conference are going to be um, Latinas in different industries. And if you particularly um, find, uh, start talking to someone who's specifically in your field, you can ask them about how their journey was, you know? And even if maybe like, if personally I was connected to someone in the medicine, like medical field, and I cannot just shut down and think like, oh, I'm not like completely, I'm not interested at all in your field. No, you know, like you are a Latina who got to like this amazing position. How did you navigate this space? You know, like how did you gain confidence along the way? Which is also a very, no, like, perfect question to ask if that's something that like you're trying to build if you're trying to build your confidence and some other some people have gone through a similar path of starting their journey in a career that they are first generation for example you can ask those questions and that's perfectly perfectly fine and something that you should um something that i think you should know like once you start talking to people online is everybody loves talking about themselves but in order for people to talk about themselves, you need to ask questions. So come prepared. Maybe these questions are um, might be helpful just for you to have like this framework of like what to ask. And then if someone is talking and you're interested in something specifically, you can keep asking them about that, right? And then this is very, very important. important. Remember at least one or two things about what they said in the conversation. So now this leads to the next step. I hope everyone kind of like got these questions written down so that you you may want to use them. Um, but then how to stay in touch. So you may at the end of your conversation ask either for their email or their LinkedIn so that you guys can stay connected. And then a day or two, or maybe within the, the next week, you may email them, introducing yourself, reminding them how um, how you met or where you met, 
uh, talk about one or two things about your conversation or something that you were either interested in or you're interested in learning more about, and you can mention the future. So when you close that email, you may say, um, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to start looking for uh, opportunities in this specific field, like this is where I want to grow. And you may even use this time, if you would be interested in learning more about these um, these people, you can ask them, oh, I would love, I would love to know if you ever have free time to connect again. I would love to learn more about, and then you, you, um, you insert what you would like to learn more about. Um, and then last, but definitely not least, be confident and be yourself. Something that I personally learned in, um, in this time was that people, like we overthink what we do when we're, when we're talking to other people, but you have to know that your goal and purpose is much, much greater than either like for, for myself, like than myself or any small mistake that I make. So something that honestly, I personally always do, I just go and if I'm interested in meeting some person, I just talk to them and ask them questions, ask everything I want to ask, and then try to stay in contact. Maybe some, maybe um, after I might overthink what I said, but in the moment, I don't care about me at all. It's all about me learning about what the other person is doing and be again, genuinely interested in what they do. And then the next thing is people are willing to help, but you care more about your future than anyone else. So be specific about what you need and be persistent in pursuing your goals. So sometimes the people, the professionals that you meet will want to help. Like a lot of people are very genuinely interested in helping, but if you don't tell them how they can help you, they probably won't know um, how to help you. So you need to be very specific. You know, this is what I want. This is what I would love to, to do in the future. Um, I would love to stay in contact for any opportunities in the future. Something that I would always say when I was in high school and I started networking back then with professionals was I would love to eventually have the opportunity to work with you if that's ever possible. And I don't know if that that allowed me to have some opportunities, so, you know, just maybe throwing it out there. So if anybody wants to use that sent sentence, feel free to do so. And if you want to stay um, connected with me, I left my email and my LinkedIn below in this presentation. So that's it. I hope that you guys have an incredible, incredible networking experience and an incredible day today. Thank you. Hi, Kiara. Thank you so much for that. That was great. I just wanted to get on here really quickly and um, again, point out where the networking feature is on. If you're on Hopin in the main stage, you'll see a toolbar to the left of your screen. Um, and um, you'll see it says live under uh, just above networking. Uh, just go ahead in there. It is going to prompt you to turn on your camera and um, you'll be able to chat, like video chat with folks. Um, I encourage you to do it. Again, networking takes practice. Don't be nervous. We're all in, uh, we all are in the same boat. We're all awake this Saturday morning or afternoon if you're in the East Coast. Um, but go out there and, you know, just put on some lip gloss and get out there and network. Bye. See you guys back here at 10.
Good morning or good afternoon, depends where you're joining us across the nation. Thank you so much for being here and joining us for our fourth day of Latina History Day. It's our 30th anniversary celebrating the great accomplishments Latinas are making across the nation and have been making for a very long time, even before this nation was this nation. So let's make note of that and just be proud of the history that we've been able to con contribute to. We'll be starting this morning by honoring our Latina future history makers. So as we honor the past, we also look to the uh, celebrate the present and look to the future. Young women who are excelling academically and are influencing, uh, influencing our, in a positive way, positive change in their communities. And then we will hear from the remarkable, remarkable role models for Latinas and women of color everywhere author Ariana Davis. And I'm just so happy to say that I believe my boys who are 14 years old, Adam and Joshua are also listening. So I can't wait for them to hear from Ms. Davis. If this is your first HOPE event, welcome to the HOPE Network and the HOPE family. I invite you to learn more about HOPE and get involved in more of our programs by following us on social media at Hope Latinas across all platforms and visiting our website, www.latinas.org. I think it's right behind me. You can see it, latinas.org. Before turning the program over to our wonderful MC for the day, I want to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors for bringing this event to life and bringing us together virtually. Our conference co-title sponsors are Coca-Cola Company and the Estee Lauder Companies. And many thanks to Union Bank and the Kaiser Permanente for sponsoring today's workshops. Now, to take us through our main program, I'm excited to welcome back the fabulous Annabelle Munoz. If you haven't heard from Annabelle, keep on tuning into ABC7. Um, she is an incredible force. We are so proud to have her and she emceed our first day of Latina History Day, and she's here to help us wrap it up. She is the race and cultural reporter for ABC7 Eyewitness News in Los Angeles and an incredible supporter and dear friend of the organization. Good morning, Annabelle. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for Buenos your Buenos dias. Buenos dias, Helen. Como amaneciste? How are you feeling? 
I'm, I'm good. I'm a little excited. I got to tell you, I, I, you know, I get so much more energy from our young participants. Um, don't get me wrong. I like the, the older <laughs> ones like myself too, but there's something about uh, being around young women that always just charges me up because I can see the future of our country in them. Yeah, and I can feel that. I can sense it. Thank you for setting the tone as we get started. Thank you for having me back. I hope I can't stress that enough. I am so excited to be part of this third day. I'm also really excited to be joining our younger generation of Latinas. Welcome, chicos, chicas, everyone who is joining us. I hope you're comfortable. I hope you've enjoyed the program so far. If you participated in any of the earlier activities, get some water, get hydrated, but then get your cafecito or your te, whatever works for you, uh, because we have a lot of really great things in store for you. Incredible speakers, incredible stories, and we're just getting started. You know, I was just thinking about this morning. Um, I, I was talking with a young lady yesterday who I hope is joining us. I featured her mom on ABC7 yesterday, an incredible immigrant from Guatemala who has done incredible things as a woman, as a mother of five children. And um, I thought, you know, I should invite her to come join the conference. And I said to her, I wish I would have known about hope when I was younger. I was always interested in current events, politics, policy, I see all of those things, did a congressional internship but I didn't know hope existed. And that's okay. I think that the way our journeys take place is exactly the way they are supposed to be. And I'm so grateful that I get to be part of hope now. I've been participating for several years. And like Helen said, um, being a part of the celebrations with the young Latinas is really one of my favorite um, parts about participating with hope. I think when hope women and hope supporters get together. It's very much like a, a big fiesta, a big family. So welcome to the family. Um, before we get the ball, or now rather, let's get the ball rolling with our amazing morning program. And for that, let me introduce you to today's workshop sponsor, Union Bank, Wendy Estrada. Wendy has been in the financial industry for 15 years and has served in various capacities. She enjoys being an advocate for her clients and serving her community. She is currently responsible for educating communities about home ownership and the importance of building generational wealth. Amen to that. I did not hear that phrase growing up. I did not know what it meant. So I'm so happy that you're here to talk to us about that. Um, she's currently responsible for educating communities uh, about those things, and she serves on the board of Bloom Again Foundation and the National Latina Business Women Association, the LA chapter. She's a mother of two and enjoys traveling and staying healthy, which I'm sure has been a little bit of a challenge during the pandemic. So feel free to give us tips on that. Good morning, Mindy. Good morning. Thank you so much, Annabelle, and thank you, Helen, and Hope, for being a trusted partner of Union Bank. As one of the founding sponsors of HOPE Youth Leadership Program, Union Bank congratulates HOPE for the great work that it has done over the past 17 years to prepare the next generation of Latina leaders. The goal of the HOPE Youth Leadership Program is to make young Latinas well-rounded leaders while empowering them to create pathways to higher education for themselves, their peers, and their families. Financial literacy has been a core tenant of the program since its inception. Together, we have trained over 3,000 young women with foundational skills of, built, of budgeting and money management. Financial literacy is very important to Union Bank and we do all we can to ensure that we are providing the tools needed so that individuals can make wise financial decisions. We will continue the work to ensure that young Latinas in high school and college are financial literate here today. We hope that you will check out the Resilient Future Workshop designed for high school students, which will, which will cover how to budget your money. Thank you so much again. Back to you, Annabelle. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, I hope that the ladies joining us will jump in, uh, take advantage of these opportunities and resources, and thank you for your dedicated support of HOPE and the young women that HOPE serves. I wholeheartedly agree that financial literacy 
is a skill that we all need to master. We are really um, taking the baton from our ancestors and building that generational wealth. So thank you for um, investing in that. Um, financial knowledge will open doors to building a bright future and will help on the journey to ensuring that we're the best version of ourselves. Um, speaking of best version of ourselves and bright futures, I now want to bring up Lisa Romero. Executive Director of Local and Cultural Relevancy in North America for the Estee Lauder Company, a long-standing supporter of Hope Latina's History Day for the past 13 years. Alicia has spent more than 15 years working on global beauty brands and has expertise in marketing, brand positioning, inclusivity, and diversity, business development, and product innovation. That's a lot of areas of expertise. In her current role, she innovates breakthrough marketing strategies, pioneering the way that women of color are reflected in prestige beauty. Today, Alicia um, will do this the honor of presenting the 2021 Latina Future History Makers. Welcome, Alicia. Gracias, Annabelle, for the warm introduction. I know it was a mouthful. Um, it's a lot to explain, but listen, my culture prepared me for this. We can do anything, right? So there's a lot in the bio. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on Latina History Day, a uh, youth day representing the Estee Lauder companies. For 13 years, the Estee Lauder companies has partnered with Hope to recognize Latina college students who are excelling academically and making an impact in their communities. As a company, we believe the gaps faced by women, particularly women of color, should be closed. We believe all genders should have equal access to job opportunities and positions of leadership, including access to tools and support to help them achieve their goals. This year's recognition is made even more special by the challenges the world has faced. We wanna take the opportunity to recognize the resilience of not just today's Future History Maker awardees, but also those of thousands of Latina high school and college students across the country who have faced the challenges of the pandemic so admirably. We acknowledge and celebrate all of you here today who have taken on the ever important role of being stewards to your community. Bravo to you all. Now on to our honorees. Future history makers are the next generation of Latina women working to make an impact in their community with involvement in activities or projects advancing in the academic field or pioneering groundbreaking research or inventions. This year, the young women have been chosen for their strength in the face of hardship, their commitment to academic excellence, and their passion for helping others and ultimately making this world a better place. These exceptional young women are already movers and shakers, among them, we have future lawyers, professors, and policymakers, but they all share one thing in common. They're exceptionally committed to pursuing equity and justice for their communities. And that's the type of attitude and commitment that can and will make history. Let's watch this video introducing the 2021 Future History Makers. My name is Gerda Nathan. I'm a Meyerhoff Scholar and Honors College student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I'm in my senior year of undergrad and I'm earning an individualized study BS degree titled Global Health Considering Environmental Factors. In the fall of 2021, I will commence my doctoral education in health promotion, education, and behavior at the University of South Carolina. I aspire to spearhead social behavioral health projects that benefit Latino populations within the U.S. and abroad. Hello. My name is Isabella Martinez. I'm a junior at the University of California, Riverside, studying business administration with a concentration in management. And within these next few years, I hope to acquire an MPA from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and eventually become a member of the US House of Representatives. Hi everyone, my name is Frida Mendez Arce and I'm a first generation Mexican woman from Portoville, California. I am currently in my fourth year of majoring in sociology and minoring in political science at Cal State Fullerton. After graduating this semester, I hope to enter into a career of public service where I will help uplift communities that are often left off of the table. I hope to live up to this name of being a future Latina history maker as I continue to uplift my fellow Latinas and our communities to the recognition they deserve. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bianca Torres Murray and I'm from Los Angeles. I'm currently a first year at the University of California, Berkeley, and I intend to major in ethnic studies and minor in public policy. 
in the future, I hope to attend law school and then work in government as a policymaker, creating equitable and just policies for the Latinx community and other communities of color in the United States. Thank you so much for this amazing honor. I'm so grateful. Hello, my name is Miriam Torres Sanchez. I'm a first year, first generation Latina at the University of California, Los Angeles. I am extremely passionate about social justice. I'm currently pursuing a double major in political science and Chicano studies with the minors in public affairs. I plan to rewrite and amplify Latino voices in political, economic, and social spaces. In the future, I aspire to be a lawyer or public official to represent my community and advocate for their needs. Felicidades to Karen, Bianca, Miriam, Frida, and Isabella on being selected as the 2021 Future History Makers. I hear it was a really competitive year, so congratulations for this accomplishment, and we wish you the best in your career, in your personal goals, and we know the entire HOPE Network is rooting for you and that we're counting on you to be change makers for all of us, so no pressure. Don't fret anyone, we know the video was not enough uh, for these young women, but we will have them back later. So you'll get to learn a little bit more about them and their experiences uh, later in the program. They'll be joining us to show their uh, closing reflections. And now to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, please help me welcome another longtime friend of the organization and member of the HOPE Advisory Board, Lorena Hernandez. She is Director of Community Impact for Comcast, um, Ms. Hernandez oversees the Foundation Comcast Community Central Programs for Volunteerism and Strategic Partnerships and Programs throughout the entire state of California. She is committed to enriching the lives of others, others through mentoring and serves as a board member or advisor to several organizations, including Upward, Uniting Professional Women, Accelerating Relationship and Development, Latinas in Tech, and SupplyBank.org. So basically, her calendar is just really busy all the time. On um, behalf of HOPE, I want to say thank you, Lorena, for securing a donation from Comcast for 200 copies of the book, What Would Frida Do? by today's keynote speaker, Ariana Davis, um, for our youth guests. The first 200 registered for today's event will receive their copy after the conference. So congratulations and thank you, Lorena, for making that happen. Good morning. Thank you so much for hosting. Really, really appreciate having such a, you know, a dynamic Latina uh, joining us for, you know, specifically this day. Uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here. I always look forward um, to being part of HOPE's, you know, Latina History Days, uh, Latina Action Day, uh, the gala, just, just the wonderful activities and events and the programs, and especially this program, really supporting our young Latinas. Um, you know, as Annabella mentioned, I've been a supporter of HOPE for more than a decade because I just truly believe in the mission of the organization. And I have seen the impact HOPE has made in empowering Latinas who go on to be today's leaders. I'm also a strong advocate and champion for our youth. I believe in the power of mentoring in positive role models. And it's for this reason that I've committed myself to mentoring, to support, and to really lift up other Latinas I'm grateful to the work for a company like Comcast, NBC, Universal, and Telemundo that invest in organizations like Chicano Latino Youth Leadership Project, Latinas in Tech, and many others. And for more than a decade, we've been investing in HOPE, the youth leadership program, to educate, engage, and empower our future leaders, each of you, so that you can be the best you can be. There is no better role model that exemplifies being authentic, real, vulnerable, and very bold leader than today's keynote speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, who's Ariana Davis. Ariana was just promoted to Senior Director of Editorial and Strategy of Oprah and Hearst Magazines, a new multi-platform of lifestyle brands, Bravo, Prior to this role, she was the digital director for O, the Oprah magazine. She's also the author of What Would Frida Do? A Guide to Living Boldly. And 
as a you know Latinx woman of color, Ariana has drawn inspiration from Carlo throughout her career, from her work at Refinery29, at Us Weekly, to her contributions at New York Magazine, Glamour, Marie Claire, Pop Sugar Latina, Studying Frida, Art and just life helped, you know, Davis forge her own path to success as a writer and editor with the goal of empowering women. She's also served as entertainment expert for Access Hollywood, for VH1, TLC, and many more. She lives in New York City with her fur baby, Leo, who I know is like probably her favorite role. Um, but I just have to say, I, I'm personally just excited to hear Ariana. Uh, I read What Would Frida Do last year when it was released. And I appreciated the way Ariana just took, you know, the reader on this amazing personal journey to learn about Frida. And I really felt your vulnerability, your heart um, on the experience, you know, that I went through in this book. And I just so appreciate you bringing that to light. Um, and so as Annabella just shared, um, we are giving a copy of What Would Frida Do? Um, and actually we're giving it to everyone, not just the first 200, wanted to make sure um, I heard that we exceeded the, the 200 goal of attendees, which is bravo to hope, um, but don't wanna leave anybody out. So each one of you will be receiving this copy, which I know you're going to appreciate. Um, and I know this is gonna help you live boldly also. So just really extremely grateful to Ariana um, to have you here to be part of Latina History Day and especially for our youth. Um, and it's gonna turn it over to you. Lorena, thank you so much for that introduction. If I could be introduced into life every day with that introduction, <laughs> amazing. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a new dog mom to my fur baby, Leo. So if you guys hear puppy barks and squealing in the backgrounds, like it's just part of, it's part of the keynote speech. He's still, he's still learning when to be quiet when mommy is working. So just had to give that heads up. Um, thank you so much to Hope Latinas for having me today. This is such an honor to be part of such an incredible weekend and such a celebration during Women's History Month of Latina history specifically. I think it's something that we don't, talk enough about and so having a specific day and weekend just dedicated to celebrating ourselves celebrating our history is is so incredible and so i just have to say thank you to everyone involved with putting this amazing incredible event together um i'm excited to join you all today as the keynote speaker if you had told me when I was a teenager that one day I would be speaking to hundreds of people as a keynote speaker I would not have believed you um, when you have a Puerto Rican mom, so my mom is fair-skinned with blonde hair and a black father who is brown-skinned, and you grow up in a mostly white private school, you are constantly followed around by the feeling of feeling other. That's my story. That's how I grew up. As a kid, I was painfully shy. I didn't have many friends. I always had my nose in a book, and my parents often had to even push me to speak up, whether it was to family or to waiters at a restaurant or strangers. My head was in the clouds and that felt like a much better, safer place than the world around me a lot of the times. I'd sometimes get bullied. I would be teased for my big curly hair. I'd be asked whether my mom was my babysitter because she didn't look like me. I'd get called a nerd just for bringing my latest book with me wherever I went. I even, you know, by my black friends would be teased and, and they would say, oh, aren't you, aren't you Mexican? And I would get teased by, you know, my Latin family about my Spanish or the fact that I had such frizzy hair. I grew up really in that in-between place of never feeling like I belonged and always feeling a bit insecure about myself. And that meant I didn't always know how to live boldly. I didn't know how to be a bold, a bold, confident person. That shyness really stuck with me through the years. It stuck with me through college. Eventually, when I first started my career, um, I started my career as an intern at Oprah's Magazine. And I was later an editor there. And then I became an editor at Us Weekly, which is a, an entertainment magazine. And then I became a senior editor and on-camera personality at Refiner, Refinery29, a website for women's empowerment. Even still, through all of that, I still had that fear of of speaking, of being myself. I still had those insecurities. I still had that feeling of never feeling good enough, of always feeling other. Um, 
I had that fear that I was still that book nerd, that I was always the one person in the room who didn't look like everyone else. Even through the years when I interviewed everyone from Oprah Winfrey to Mariah Carey and John Legend and Will Smith, big moments, right? But still, even in those moments, I still questioned myself. Self. I still had that nervousness, that uncertainty. And even now in my job leading Oprah Winfrey's digital platforms, even now today as the keynote speaker at this Latina History Day conference, I still feel insecure. I still feel like, why am I here? I still feel that I, I question myself and I have those insecurities. So I know many of you probably watching this are wondering, how can you still be shy? You've done all of those things that you just listed. How could you possibly still be insecure? I remember a few years ago, I wrote an article about something called imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is loosely defined as doubting your abilities and feeling like a fraud. From when I was an awkward teenager through every single achievement of my adult career, I've experienced imposter syndrome. And it's something that I'm willing to bet many of you watching this are probably familiar with. It's that feeling of experiencing something, an accomplishment, something great at work or in school, something good in your life, and then wondering, how did this happen? It can't be that I'm just good enough, right? How did I beat out all of these people to get this opportunity? It's the feeling that it must be luck, that you don't know how you ended up somewhere. But for me, it's like, there's no way I'm good enough to write a book about Frida Kahlo or to run Oprah Winfrey's website or to give a keynote speech. Imposter syndrome is very real. In fact, according to a recent study, it affects 70% of people at some point or another in their lives. And it disproportionately, of course, affects women who are more likely to question their self-worth than men. No surprise there. Let, let, let me just say it. But over the years, I found a little secret to battling imposter syndrome, to battling those insecurities, and to overcome any fears that I might have to live a life that's bold, to live life boldly, to go after the opportunities like going after a job, running Oprah's website, or writing a book. And that little secret is studying the lives of women I admire. Over the years, the greatest motivator for me when I've been down or doubting myself has been looking at or reading about the lives of strong, successful women who came before me. And many of them are Latina. The best part is that when I read these stories, whether it's going back to read a biography or just randomly Googling someone that I admire or going into the notes section on my phone and finding quotes that I've written down over the years from some of these women, is that I'm reminded by reading their stories, reading about their lives, that they all had their own insecurities. They all had their own fears. They all had obstacles that they had to overcome to become who they eventually were meant to be, to become the names that have gone down in the history books. For me, I feel like I have this mental library of names and idols who remind me, if they could do it, why can't you? Julia, Julia de Burgos, for instance, was just a girl who loved writing. She was someone who grew up in poverty in Puerto Rico as the eldest of 13 siblings. She struggled after moving to New York City as an adult and enduring several failed marriages and relationships. And yet, through it all, she still became a well-known poet and civil rights activist, particularly for Afro-Latinas. Today, thanks to her beautiful poetry and activism work, there are streets, schools, parks named after her everywhere from Chicago to New York to Puerto Rico. Celia Cruz was a girl who was the oldest of 14 children in Havana, Cuba, one who adored singing from a young age, but whose family discouraged her from her career in music because it wasn't seen as respectable. So she did what she had to do. She would sneak around to perform. She would record singles at the local radio station. She made her own way, despite the disapproval of her family and her father. Today, nearly two decades after her death, the Grammy winner is celebrated for releasing more than 37 albums throughout her lifetime, many that have become the soundtrack for many of our lives. She is still to this day known as the Queen of Salsa. Selena Quintanilla grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas, the English-speaking daughter of Mexican-American parents. Her American upbringing meant that through her music career, she also felt other and in between cultures, much like I did. She was often called either not Mexican enough or not American enough, but she still stayed determined to improve her Spanish, to sing in both Spanish and English with musical influences from both cultures. She wanted to build barriers between the Tejano music-loving Mexican com community and the American pop music that she grew up around. After her tragic death at just 23 in 1995, her legacy still lives on. There was just even a Netflix series released about her this past year. 
Sonia Sotomayor was the daughter of hardworking Puerto Rican parents in the Bronx, her mother a clinic nurse and her father a worker. She herself found the love of her life, got married and had two children, and then her husband died in 1963, and suddenly she found herself a single mother raising two children while she juggled a career in politics. But today, Sonia is the first Latina Supreme Court justice in US history, nominated by President Barack Obama in 2009 and known for many accomplishments throughout her career. I mean, can we just have a moment for her sign, swearing in Vice President Kamala Harris at the inauguration this past year? It was, it was such an incredible moment for women, for Latinas, for women of color. Jennifer Lopez, have to mention her, grew up as a sports and dance loving teenager, also in the Bronx. She had no idea when she used to ride the six train to school that sometimes those moments when she had holes in her shoes, that eventually she would become a household name known for the thousand dollar pairs of shoes that she would wear on her feet as a millionaire movie star, entrepreneur, Grammy winning singer. And if I'm talking about bold Latinas who have paved the way, I also have to talk about Frida Kahlo. Last fall, I wrote my first book, What Would Frida Do? A Guide to Living Boldly. All of the women that I mentioned above have been women whose lives I've studied, women who are personal role models to me, but I think Frida has to be one of the biggest. I learned about Frida's art and her work in school. Growing up Latina, her image was something I was familiar with. I would see it in, you know, on, on walls and in people's houses, but it wasn't until I was in high school and I saw the movie Frida starring Selma Hayek, which is now on Netflix, by the way. If you haven't seen it, please highly recommend. But it was that movie that really turned my interest from just interest into infatuation. That was when I really learned the story behind this artist, the story behind this icon and all of the many obstacles she went through in her life before she became the household name that we know of as Frida. That inf infatuation carried with me through my adult life, so much so that a few years ago when a book publisher approached me because they had been following my writing about Black and Latino women, and they had heard about my obsession with Frida and wondered if I might have interest in writing a book about her. So you might guess at this point in the story might be where I bring up that imposter syndrome. Me writing a book about the Frida Kahlo, I couldn't believe it. I, I was in disbelief for many reasons. One, I'm not Mexican. I had never written a book before. I'm Latina, but I know that how much she means to her home country of Mexico. She's also someone who's been written about and captured so many times. In fact, there was a really big biography published about her in 1983 by Hayden Herrera. And that's pretty much known as like the gold standard of Frida biographies. It's the book that was actually the basis for the movie starring Selma Hayek. So in my mind, there was no way I was possibly capable of writing this book. But then I thought about Frida's life and the story I would be telling. Frida, who had dreams of becoming a doctor when she was in a trolley accident at 18 that left her with several severe injuries that affected her for the rest of her life. Frida, who turned the suffering and pain she endured into beautiful art, art that decades later we are still sharing and talking about on Instagram and Pinterest and Tumblr. Frida, who endured a toxic marriage, multiple miscarriages, and a lifetime of illnesses that eventually led to her death at age 47. But now, in 2021, she's a household name, someone whose art is as ubiquitous as the image of her face. We all know, it's on my t-shirt, we all know that those direct, strong eyes beneath the unibrow, we know that image, and we also know that she is a symbol of strength. So when I got the offer to write this book, I thought about all the lessons that Frida's life has taught me over time about how to live life fully and boldly, despite the challenges that life might throw your way or the fact that you might have insecurities like I often do. For Frida, her insecurities were about her leg. One was shorter than the other because she had polio as a child and also her non-Eurocentric features. She had very strong, um, not necessarily feminine features and she had that famous unibrow and the, and the mustache. And she still, even with all those insecurities, when she painted herself portraits, she painted herself exactly as she was. She painted the unibrow, she painted the mustache, she painted her actual features as they were. So as I was thinking about whether or not to go on the journey of potentially writing this book about Frida, I thought to myself, if Frida could push through all of that back in the 1920s, the 1930s and 40s, when women were definitely not being encouraged to be bold, much less Mexican women, I thought, how can I at least not try to write this book? So I did it. That's how the concept of what would Frida do was born. After literally asking myself the question in regards to whether I could write this book, I asked myself, what would Frida do? Would Frida write this book? 
And the answer was she would absolutely write this book and she would not worry about what other people had to say or what they might think. Looking back now, less than, yeah, I think it's been about six months since I published What Would Frida Do? I have to say it was one of the best decisions I ever made, deciding to write a book to share with others all the lessons that I've learned from Frida and the things that I often to this day need to pull for myself when imposter syndrome and insecurity comes and rears its ugly head. Even after I finished writing the book, which took about a year and was written mostly from my New York apartment right here and also for a bit in Mexico City where Frida's from, even after publishing the book this past year in this pandemic, I've often found myself asking, what would Frida do? I think that question is one that we could ask of any of the bold women that I just talked about. What would Celia Cruz do? What would Sonia Sotomayor do? What would Selena Quintanilla do? From Celia Cruz to Frida Kahlo, each and every one of these women that I named overcame their own unimaginable obstacles, self-doubt, challenges, insecurities, and much more to become the names that eventually are now known in the history books. And these are just some of, some of the most well-known Latinas in history, but there are many more hidden figures whose names we may never know. There are women who have been the backbone of our society, of our culture, our abuelas and our mothers and our tias and our mentors, all of the women in our lives whose unimaginable strength also deserve books and movies and TV shows. Women like my own 92-year-old grandmother who came to New York as a young, scared 20-something from Puerto Rico having no idea the family legacy that she was about to begin. Women like my friend Natalia Harris who didn't let the fact that she had a bionic leg stop her from modeling in magazines and on Project Runway before cancer took her life last year, just 24 years old. Women like Fabiola, who cleans the offices of O every single day with a smile on her face, always remembering every single person's name and asking about their family, their friends, how they're feeling. Not every strong woman will see the success in the same way that a Frida Kahlo did or that a Selena Quintanilla did, and they will definitely not always be re remembered in the large way that they should. But as I'm thinking about those of you who are on the other sides of your screen watching me speak today, I already know that if you're here today, taking time out of your Saturday to learn more about your history and to be inspired and empowered by other women in their stories. I know that every single one of you is someone whose story will be told for decades to come, whether it's just by your family or it is in the history books. People will one day look back and think about you and your life and say, remember how strong and incredible she was? As for me, I'm only 33, which I know to some of you I, in the audience for this youth day, that might sound old, but it's still incredibly young. And I hopefully knock on wood have so much life ahead of me. And I know that every single day, all I can do is wake up and do my best to live my life as boldly as the women who came before me did. Because as Salia Cruz put it, la vida es un carnaval. And so in my opinion, as Frida Kahlo put it, we have no choice but to just do one, day, one thing, which is Viva La Vida. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Thank you to Hope Latinas for having me and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your weekend. Ariana, I don't, I don't even know where to start. Um, thank you. I had chills. I wish I had a notebook and I was taking notes throughout everything that you shared with us. And, and what I really wanna say is thank you for not holding on to everything that you've learned, to all of the knowledge that you've sought out, um, because I think that's the beauty of it, right? You could keep it to yourself, you could invest in yourself, but you are sharing that with other women. And I also wanna share something else. Um, fellow Frida fan over here, this is in my living room. <laughs> Obviously, Sama is Frida, um, but I can't wait to have your book in my living room as well to learn more about her. So thank you, um, I think, you know, Many of us, after listening to you and getting to know you on, on such a vulnerable and real level, will be asking ourselves, what would Adiana do as well? Um, and thank you for elevating the fact that there's so many stories that will never be known on such a large platform. And as a storyteller, it is our jobs, right, to share those stories. Um, not everyone has to be known worldwide so that we can uplift those stories on our platforms, whatever that platform looks like, right? Sharing those stories um, with the people in our lives. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm so grateful that you were here with us. Thank you so much for having me. Leo also says goodbye. <laughs> Bye, Leo. <laughs> he behaved.
<laughs> really well. Um, and I was checking out Ariana's social media earlier. There was so much on her Instagram account that I resonated with, and I'm sure you will too. And you probably want to stay posted on what she's up to, what she's writing. Um, so we encourage you to follow her as well on social media. Her Instagram is Ariana G A B at Ariana G A B, and that's Ariana with two N's. On Twitter, it is Ariana G Davis. So follow her, stay tuned on what she's up to, and don't forget there's 200 very lucky guests today who are going to receive a copy of her book. Again, I can't wait to get my hands on it. I hope there's an ebook so I can start reading it now. Um, and this is such a great way to close the morning program. Um, with that, we are going to end the Facebook live stream, not the entire program. So if you wanna take part in today's breakout sessions on career, financial wellness that we were talking about, identity, be sure to register on Hop In. The Hope staff is going to drop that registration link in the chat and it is completely free, so come on over. <laughs>